So we're going to discuss refractive errors here, and this is so common. Uh, usually this is the domain of the optometrist. Uh, they're responsible for diagnosing this and treating it, but as a physician, especially if you're primary care or pediatrics, you're going to need to have some awareness of what this is because it's just so tremendously common, and you're also going to need to be aware of presbyopia and astigmatism, especially if you're working with adults. Uh, so um, let's go ahead and uh, just note some uh, basic facts here. These are really important that I want you to know both for clinical practice and for the test. So all refractive errors in childhood, basically any visual deficit, uh, can leads to an increased risk of amblyopia, which is a permanent deficit. And so that's why it's extremely important that all of these are treated as quickly as they are diagnosed. Uh, so because of that, the American Optometric Association actually recommends that all children have their first eye examination at six months of age. So a lot younger than you would think that a kid should go get their eyes examined. It's a lot younger than you get your first uh, dental exam. Uh, but six months of age is the recommended age for the first optometric examination. So this is my really simplified anatomy of the eye, is at least uh, just the structures that we're concerned with uh, for our talk here. So we have uh, this is just a cross section looking laterally uh, or medially. Uh, so we have the cornea, which covers the eye. There's the pupil, uh, which is the hole going into the eye. There's the lens here, which is attached to the ciliary muscles superiorly and inferiorly. And in the back of the eye here is the retina. So I'm leaving out some things, uh, but these are the things that you need to be aware of for uh, this talk. Okay, myopia, or nearsightedness, is where the image projects in front of the retina. So normally, the image, as it's supposed to be projected, projects onto the retina. But in myopia, the image is projected in front of the retina, so when it gets to the retina, it's out of focus, it's distorted. And this affects as much as 20 to 50 percent of the population in the U.S., so that sounds like a lot, and it is, but not all people are myopic, or hyperopic for that matter, when we get to that, to the same degree. So some people are only just slightly myopic, and they might not even notice it, apart from maybe they have a little bit of a headache when they're reading. Uh, but then there are other people that are so myopic that they read because everything's blurry, or they can't see the chalkboard, or uh, they can't see their toys properly. Uh, the extent varies. What is the cause? There are two different causes of myopia when we're talking about young children. And it really just goes to the physics. So why would an image pro uh, project in front of the retina? Well, A number one, the image can project in front of the retina because the refractive system, what's supposed to project the image, is too convex. It's too converging. So the image is converging before it gets to the retina, and so it's projected before the retina. So if you think of rays going through a lens, it converges too quickly, and so it's projected in front of the retina. That's refractive myopia. Axial myopia is myopia, but it's not a problem of the refractive system so much as it's a problem of the eye itself. So the eye is too long. And so even though the refractive system is projecting the image in the right place physically, because the eye is too long, the retina is behind the image. And so the projection point is in front of the retina. So either because the uh, image is projected in front of the retina because you have uh, too much convergence in the lens and cornea, or because the eye is too long, those are both reasons to have an image projected in front of the retina. There's also acute myopia, and so this is especially in diabetes. What can happen is uh, glucose can get, I'm not sure if it's glucose, but it's a sugar, 
gets inside the lens and the lens will swell and that increases its convexity and that results in uh, essentially a refractive myopia. But that would be an acute myopia in a patient with severe hypoglycemia. Okay, so regardless of what the reason is behind the myopia, refractive or axial, it's going to cause similar symptoms. Blurry vision and typically with myopia, because it's nearsightedness, it's uh, the vision uh, looking at things that are far away is worse than looking at things close up. So these are patients that will get up close to something in order to see it. Uh, they'll have typically eye strain because of, uh, because of the difficulty seeing, it can cause headache, it can cause learning difficulties in uh, preschool and grade school, and typically it'll be difficulties reading the blackboard because that's far away. And the way this is diagnosed is by optometric examination using the Snellen chart, but ultimately in order to diagnose this, it needs to be in a formal optometric setting. The treatment is diverging lenses. So if you have a refractive system that's too convex and you use a diverging lens, it equals itself out. And so the image is project, projected onto the retina. And it's the same if you have axial myopia. What a diverging lens does is it just pushes back where the image is projected so that it's projected properly for that longer eye. And these lenses can be either glasses or contacts, whichever the patient prefers. Uh, usually when they're really little, we have them on glasses, but once they get older, uh, either for cosmetic reasons or if they're in sports uh, or for whatever reason, they may want contacts. It's becoming more and more prevalent to get LASIK. However, uh, and LASIK stands for uh, laser in situ uh, keratol, uh, uh, what is it? keratomelusis, uh, and um, this can't, can't be done until the eye is done developing, uh, but usually around 18 to 21 years old, patient can go in and get LASIK. It takes like five minutes, and all they're doing is they're uh, using a laser to burn away part of the uh, lens, and that uh, will fix either the convexity or the concavity uh, if it's hyperopia. So uh, LASIK can be done and that's a permanent treatment and typically that cures the myopia or hyperopia. So this is just an example what I mean by uh, refractive myopia where the lens is, uh, is not uh, projecting properly. Uh, and so here we have too convex of a lens, and so it's uh, projecting in front of the retina. And then here we have an axial myopia where the eyeball is too long, and so even though the uh, even though the lens is projecting proper space, if the eye was a normal length, uh, it's still in front of the retina, and so nevertheless we get a, uh, a distorted image. So hyperopia is the opposite. The image is projecting behind the retina, so we're still getting a distorted image because it's not projecting on the retina. The overall prevalence in the US for hyperopia is about 10%. So this is a little less common than myopia. There's a hereditary component to hyperopia. It tends to run in families. And hyperopia, uh, is uh, the risk is increased in children of mothers who smoked during their pregnancy. So again, with hyperopia, there's a refractive cause and an axial cause. So with refractive hyperopia, the image projects behind the retina because the refractive system is too concave. And so in that case, you have a lens that is too diverging. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, projecting quickly enough. In axial hyperopia, the image projects behind the retina because the eye is too short. And so just for the opposite re reason of axial myopia with axial hyperopia, because the eye is too short, the projection point is going to be behind the retina. And so I'll just show you a picture real quick. So with refractive hyperopia, uh, you have uh, a lens that is not 
projecting or that, that's not uh, converging quickly enough, so it's more of a divergent lens, uh, increase in concavity. Uh, with axial hyperopia, the eyeball is too short, and so it projects behind the retina. But both of these cause the same thing, hyperopia. So again, the symptoms are going to be blurry vision, but here it's going to be uh, near worse than far. So these uh, kids will have more difficulty with reading and writing because that's an up-close activity. And of course, they'll also have eye strain and a headache. Uh, the eye strain and headache can be worse with hyperopia because the eyes are going to attempt to accommodate to... And, what that is is, you know, when you look at something close up, your ciliary muscles pull on your lens, and that uh, makes it easier to see things close up. And so the ciliary muscles will be very active in uh, patients with untreated hyperopia, and that can cause uh, strain and headache. The diagnosis here, again, is optometric examination. It's made in the optometrist's office. And the treatment is converging lenses. So you use the opposite lenses that you would use in myopia, and that allows you to project the image quicker. Uh, and so rather than projecting the image in the back uh, of the retina, you would project it at the retina. And again, with hyperopia, you can also do LASIK. But that needs to be done after the eye is developing. So the, that's not done on little children. That's done on adults. Okay, presbyopia. So remember when I talked about that ciliary muscle, uh, which is responsible for, uh, for uh, making the lens uh, more convex, which allows us to see things closer. Uh, you also, uh, in, in order to make your lens more convex, the lens needs to be fluid. You need to be able to pull the lens. And with presbyopia, the, uh, you have a progressive decrease in the ability to focus on near objects, and that's because of a loss of elasticity of the lens or a decrease in strength of the ciliary muscles. And so both of those are important for accommodating, for seeing things up close. And if you can't do those, and th that ability tends to decline with age, uh, that's going to make it more difficult to read, to see things up close. And so a lot of times what these patients will do in order to make up for that is they'll, if they're reading a book, they'll pull it further away from, from their face in order to see the writing. My mom does this a ton. And I tell her she's got presbyopia. She won't go in, get anything fixed. So. Uh, so, like I said, this can be either due to an elas a, a loss of elasticity of the lens or because a de of a decreased strength of those ciliary muscles that are responsible for uh, pulling the lens uh, into an appropriate position. And as a matter of fact, uh, when the eye is tired, the ciliary muscle can become fatigued and you can get symptoms similar to presbyopia, even if you're not old. So the symptoms of presbyopia, it's an older patient, they have eye strain, difficulty seeing in dim light. Uh, remember that the ciliary muscles are also responsible uh, for, uh, for uh, increasing the pupil size. And so that can, uh, if those muscles are weak, it's going to be difficult to allow more light in. Difficulty reading small print or seeing near objects close up. And the patient will tend to move the object farther away to see it clearer. So look at this picture. This guy has presbyopia. Nobody reads a book that far away. You read it up closer to your face. When patients get presbyopia, they can't accommodate as well. And so they have to move the object further away to see it clearer. Diagnosis, usually this can be made clinically, but formally you need an optometric examination. And the treatment is converging lenses. So essentially what you have here is a hyperopia because the lens cannot become uh, convex enough to, uh, to project the image properly. You would use a converging lens uh, that would then project the image properly onto the retina. And so 
essentially this is like a hyperopia, but you develop it in older age, and it's not because of a refractive error, but it's because of a loss of elasticity in the lens or decreased strength of the ciliary muscles. And so you can get lenses for this. A lot of times you can get these over the counter. If you ever go to the gas station or to Walgreens and you see the lenses that are for sale, usually they're gearing these towards presbyopia, reading glasses. Uh, so you can get these either prescription or over the counter. And there's also a LASIK surgery uh, that can be done for presbyopia as well. Okay, then finally astigmatism. So this is a complicated topic. So, behind astigmatism, what you need to know is that the refractive system uh, works both horizontally and vertically. So, up until now, we've kind of been talking about, we've, we've talked about the refractive system as sort of a monodimensional uh, uh, object or monodimensional system. But remember that you're looking at things in well, things are projected onto your retina in two dimensions. And so with astigmatism, what it's based off of is that you can have irregular curvature of that refractive system in both dimensions, in both the vertical and horizontal dimension. And so uh, that irregular curvature can result in different projection points on different axes. So for instance, you could project your vertical axis onto your retina properly, but the horizontal axis is uh, projected behind the retina because of abnormal uh, abnormalities of the refractive system. So this will make more sense when I show you some pictures. Okay, so regular astigmatism. Let me show you these pictures here. So let's say, for instance, you're looking at the vertical axis. Your lens may project the vertical axes of what you see in front or behind the retina, but the horizontal axes can be projected, may be projected onto the retina. And all that has to do with is the three-dimensional curvature of the refractive system. I don't want to make this too complicated. So there's different kinds of astigmatism. So first off is regular astigmatism, and this is where the vertical and horizontal meridians are perpendicular. The vertical and horizontal axes are perpendicular. And you might think, well, shouldn't vertical and horizontal be perpendicular? Yes, but the lens can be so irregularly shaped that the axes may not even be perpendicular. And I'm not even going to get into that detail, uh, so we're just going to talk about regular astigmatism here. So there's simple myopic astigmatism, and that's where one focal line, be it vertical or horizontal, is projected onto the retina and another in front of it, like myopia. There's simple hyperopic astigmatism, where one focal line is on the retina and another one's behind it, like hyperopia. And then there's compound myopic astigmatism, where both focal lines are in front of the retina, but they may be at different points and compound hyperopic astigmatism, where both focal lines are behind the retina, but again, they may be at different points. Uh, they, they may not project at exactly the same point. This affects about 30% of children in the U.S., and the symptoms are similar to what you would have with myopia or hyperopia. Blurry vision, eye strain, headaches, learning difficulties, and fatigue. So here's simple myopic, myopic astigmatism. So one focal line is projected in front of the retina, the other one is projected on it. And then here's simple hyperopic astigmatism, where one line is projected behind and the other one on the retina. Here's a compound myopic astigmatism, so the vertical axis is, uh, is projected at one point in front of the retina, and the horizontal axis is projected at a different point in front of the retina, but they're both in front of the retina. So that's a compound myopic, myopic astigmatism. Here's a compound hyperopic astigmatism where they're both projected behind the retina at different points. Remember, if they projected at the same point, then you'd just have hyperopia. So the whole astigmatism thing just means that you've got your horizontal and vertical axes projecting at 
at different points. That's really what it is. And then this is a mixed astigmatism. So your vertical axis, axis and your horizontal axis are projecting at, uh, one's projecting behind and another projecting in front. Okay, so if you're an optometry student or an optometrist, this is probably a terrible description of astigmatism because astigmatism is really so much more complex than this. But if you are a primary care physician, internal medicine, surgery, pediatrics, if you know this much about astigmatism, you're, you're in the 90th percentile at least. Okay, so astigmatism really isn't the domain of primary care physician, but you need to be aware that it exists. And you also need to be aware that astigmatism needs to be treated right away because it can lead to further problems, including amblyopia. Okay, so this is what you may see if you have astigmatism. So the horizontal focus can be blurred, but the vertical axis is fine, or the vertical axis can be blurred, but the horizontal axis is fine, or they both might be blurred. So what do we do for this in order to diagnose it? Again, just like everything else we've talked about here, examination by an optometrist. They'll make the formal diagnosis. It's really the same treatment as you would do for any of the other refractive problems. They just get a, a different kind of eyeglasses or contact lenses, and there is LASIK for astigmatism as well. It's just the laser is going to do different things. And shave off different parts of the lens than it normally would. And that is everything.